Hello, and welcome to Book Break for Greece Public Library. I'm Kirstra. I'm one of the librarians here. I moderate our Pints and Prose book discussion group. I'm joined, as always, by my end-of-the-year reader, Claire. Thank you, Kirstra. I am Claire. I moderate As the Page Turns and our historical group on Facebook. Mm -hmm. And today is a very special episode. This is one of my favorites, I, although I feel like I say that about every episode. I know. But it's our look back at 2022, best of 2022. The best of. Best of. So before we dive into, I think we both picked five, right? Top five books. Yeah, well, I pick one more, but I'm going to make a decision. And there's a bonus. Yeah. Oh, <laughs> last minute, last minute choice. That's right. Um, so before we dive in, let's just talk a little bit about what your year in reading was like. I had a great year in reading. Did I you? think I had my best year ever. Really? I'm, I'm up to 90 books. And I have you to partly thank for that. Look at you go. Because I started listening to audiobooks. And that really expanded my range. It's a game changer. It, it's a total game changer. So now mm -hmm. I actually look forward to whenever I have a car trip, I'm listening to a book instead of just listening to the same music that I mm -hmm. always would listen to. <laughs> Absolutely. So did you find, I mean, I also had a prolific year. Um, we've been doing a lot of work on our house, like painting. Um, and the only thing that gets me through like an entire Saturday of painting a house is audiobooks. So I also listen to a ton of audiobooks this yeah. year. Um, did you notice any like themes in your reading or anything like that? I think this was the theme year and basically because of book break and also doing book clubs mm -hmm. is kind of getting out of my comfort zone. Like mm. we did that sci-fi issue. Yes. So I started reading sci-fi and now I'm reading more of it. Um, I read romance for the first time and one of them, yes, people, unbelievable, made it to my best of list. Stop it. Yeah. Yeah. Aren't you proud? I don't know who you are anymore. I know. Just, <laughs> just reaching you know going in new directions so that's awesome yeah yeah so um I feel like I had a lot of um like continuations of series this mm -hmm. year like there were a few series that I started last year that like the next book came out that I was eagerly awaiting um so I have a lot of those from this year and I also feel like I had a lot of three star reads Oh, yeah. And some four star reads, but not a lot of books that like blew me out of the water this year. OK, I, I did. I did have more than I thought I would have mm -hmm. that I listed as five star reads. Some of them I knocked down when I started going through this process. Um, yeah. But very few stinkers. I, I That's I, good. Yeah. Well, I've totally gotten to the point where if I don't like it, if it doesn't grab me by 100 pages. Mm, you bailing. I'm bailing. Unless it's for a book club and I have to discuss it. So That's totally fair. Yeah. Um, we actually had that conversation at our last Pints and Prose meeting um, where someone was like, you know, I started this book and everybody that I know loved this book and I'm just like slogging through it. And I was like, let it go. Mm -hmm. Life is too short. Right. Like read what you want to read. Yeah. yeah. I also realized my stack of shame is still shameful. Uh-oh. Because I'm just too easy. I'm like a net. I'm too easily distracted by new releases. So I am You're unapologetically magpie. diving into the new. And that's fine. See, and that's, that's something like I read a ton of nonfiction this year, but all of it was back catalog. None mm -hmm. of it was published this year. Yeah. Um, so I feel like I'm perpetually catching up and you're like, out at the front, like leading the charge. Yes, but you you would you go through your stack of shame, whereas mine yeah. just quietly gets shoved off <laughs> to the side. It gets a little more shameful. Yeah, it's very shameful at this point. Yeah. Oh well. All right. So, do you want to kick us off with one of your five star reads? Sure. Or one of your best of 2022. Yes, I say. this is one of my best. It was a book of the month club choice, mm -hmm. and it's relatively recent. I think it just came out in November. It is Signal Fires by Danny Shapiro. Mm. And if you remember, um, I really liked her memoir, Inheritance. Yes. So I, she has actually written quite a few memoirs and then went back into fiction. Mm -hmm. So. Signal Fires is a very moving book. I love her style of writing. 
and her usage of language, her usage of quotes in this book. Um, it was amazing. It's also a shorter novel, so it was great to pick up at this time of year. Nice. I think I read it in one day, but I was also, I've been, I've had some sick days, you know, mm-hmm. in this month. So that really worked for me. But it starts on August 27th, 1985. Okay. Um, siblings Sarah and Theo decide to go joyriding. Sarah's had a few beers. So she tosses the keys to her 15-year-old brother and lets mm. him drive. Um, they pick up one of her friends. Unfortunately, he is not a very proficient driver. He gets distracted. I forget whether it was the radio or something, you know, very mundane. Um, and he has an accident, and their friend is killed. Hey. Yes. Um, so this one huge mistake uh, affects not just Sarah and Theo, because Sarah makes the decision, and she tells her father that she was driving the car. Mm. So she's taking the blame. Um, it affects them, it affects the neighbors across the street, and the novel kind of bounces back and forth, so you, it was good that I read it in a day, because you kind of have to keep up with it, with the Mm, dates. Got it. But, um, it, it kind of shows you, though, what will happen with holding a secret, and how it just starts to eat away at your life, and then how do you get back to a good resolution, but, um... So there was a young couple that move in across the street. They have a little boy who is probably somewhere on the spectrum, um, very interested in stars and planets. And he kind of makes a connection with the father of Sarah and Theo. Meanwhile, their mom has Alzheimer's. So you've got Mm. like these three different storylines. And of course, they converge. But it was very moving. Um, I just really liked it. I probably would say if you had something like a personal tragedy like that in your life, this may not be the book for you because it it gives you the very real repercussions Mm -hmm. of the decision and what happens and how it fractures people. But um, I personally, you know, really loved it. I loved the different characters and Hmm. I loved how real they were. They weren't perfect people, but they were not heinous. You know how some books Mm -hmm. you just hate the people? Right. It's like they're like cartoony bad. Yeah, I don't I don't really care about you. But this I did. Mm -hmm. You know, you felt like you knew them and you know, even just the other things that are going through in the book, like giving up the family home and what happens Mm. when you have a spouse that has all you know, it was very, very well done. Okay. So that sounds really good. It sounds like it would be a good book discussion book. Oh, excellent. Yeah, I think it would make a really good one. Mm-hmm. So Nice. All right. Well, that's the first one I'm going to have to add to my list. Yep. Yep. Here we go. You're killing me. Um, all right. So I'm going to start then with the book that I read the most recently from my list. Um, so it's a late breaking addition to my best of 2022. And that is Where I Can't Follow by Ashley Blooms. Um, and this is actually one that I talked about in our 2022 preview um, and just got around to picking up. um, And I'm so glad that I did. So this book, um, a lot of my books this year were genre fiction Mm -hmm. or had genre elements in a more literary style. And this is definitely one of those. So I wouldn't call this science fiction. I would call it like speculative fiction. One of those like on the edge books. Um, So it's set in Appalachia, probably Kentucky. Um, Our main character is Marin. She is um, in her early 20s. Uh, She lives with her grandmother who raised her um, and she is having a tough time. They're in a pretty rural community. It's been hit fairly hard by the opioid crisis Um, and Marin is literally just barely scraping by taking care of herself and her grandmother, who has started to show some signs of dementia. So the genre element in this book is that in this world, um, every so often, and you never know why, and you never know when or who, um, sometimes people will find, they call them a little door, Um, And it could look like anything. It's not necessarily a physical door, um, but it is a portal. It is. A portal. It is. It's a portal, um, and no one knows where the doors go. All you know is that if someone takes their door, you never see them again. 
Oh, wow. So they end up somewhere else, somewhere else. No one knows. Um, but that person is gone. And you will never see them again. So pretty early on in this book, Marin gets a door. So she's kind of sorting through her life and trying to figure out a way to keep herself afloat. Um, her best friend has some mental health issues and is maybe not taking her meds. Oh. Um, so she's got just a ton of pressure on her. And her mother took a door when Marin was about three or four. So this is always kind of in the background of her life and her relationship with her grandmother that her mother got a door and her mother left. Um, so when Marin's door appears, it's it kind of brings all of that back around and Marin has to really deal with what's going on in her life in a new way. So it's it's a beautiful book. It's fairly short, um, but it's the writing is really lovely, and it's really at its core a book about choices mm -hmm. and the choices that we make and what we do when we feel like we don't have any choices left. Um, and it's ultimately hopeful, so that's good because a lot of the stuff that Marin is dealing with is fairly bleak. Yeah. Um, but it is ultimately a hopeful book, and I just really, really enjoyed it. Um, it's very atmospheric. Um, well, you had me in Appalachia. I so. know. And I would actually recommend this to anyone who read Winter's Bone Ooh, and I, liked that one. Yeah, I like that one, too. Um, yeah. So this has got some of the same atmosphere with some additional little twists to okay. it. Okay. I'm going to have to remember that one. Mm -hmm. So uh, now we've just tagged each other. In there a, you go. All right. <laughs> so speaking of Appalachia. Ah, uh, here we go. This was another late ad for me, but... Mm -hmm. Demon Copperhead by Barbara Kingsolver, mm -hmm. which I believe was the November Oprah pick. So probably we all know how I adore celebrity book clubs. Mm -hmm. So no, no <laughs> apologies. But um, this was one of my best reads, but it was also one of the best audio books. Not that I have a huge history, but mm -hmm. um, that I've ever heard because the narrator was Charlie Thurston and he did an incredible job. He just became this character for me and um the thing about demon copperhead supposedly this was based on charles dickens great expectations or oh david copperfield david copperfield right. but i haven't read david copperfield <laughs> hanging head in shame yeah. but um so i didn't really have that comparison mm -hmm. to work with i was just looking at this as an american saga very much about the opioid crisis but okay. um and about this character demon copperhead but what made this book so memorable is he had such a sense of humor i mean his life mm. was horrible for the most part um but he just was so funny that even though a lot of really tragic things were happening, just the way he saw everything mm -hmm. and, and had this sense of humor and just irony about it was just, you know, I couldn't wait to read it. The, um, so what happens, the last third of the book, I have to say, got tough because mm -hmm. that's when Demon himself is grown up enough that he gets into a relationship with a, a girl who is like his you know, manic pixie dream girl, you know, and he gets into the drugs as well. And that was just, oh my God, it was just so painful, you know, to watch what went on there. But like your book, this one did have a somewhat hopeful ending. Like he sees okay. light at the end of the tunnel and gets help. Um, so <laughs> he starts out, he's born in a trailer, you know, too soon no time for the hospital he's born with a call i guess mm -hmm. so um the, one of the the old wives tales is he'll never drown well his father drowned so that effect mm. that always is with him the fact that he never met his father um he has the red hair from him he was uh what did they call, they had um, a certain group of people and i can't think of the name now where they were all like mixed race mm -hmm. um but that's where he descended from. But his mother was a single mom. She worked at Walmart. 
you know, she would struggle with alcohol and then pills. So he had to like grow up fast. Like he mm-hmm. was, you know, come on, mom up, you know, time to get ready for work and mm-hmm. trying to get himself ready for school. And just, you start to see the, the poverty, but the spirit of the people, um, it was just really, really good. This was set in Lee County, Virginia, which is mm-hmm. the very, very Western part of Virginia. You know, a lot of mining, mm-hmm. you know, a lot of industry that's gone, um, The one thing I'm very grateful of is even though he was placed in different foster homes and things, you never got into like sexual abuse with this book. Because I I think if she had put one more thing on there, it would have just been too much, Sure, you know, for me. But not that, you know, any of his placements were great, um, Mm -hmm. except for when he finally gets placed with a football coach. And he starts to develop that way. But, and that's eventually, though, what leads him into his own drug habit is when he gets injured. So, But um, it is kind of an American saga. But if you like Appalachia, if you like any of Barbara Kingsolver's other books, I would highly recommend this one. And like I said, even if you don't normally do audiobooks, I thought this narrator was fantastic. Nice. So, Demon Copperhead. So, I will say I have already tagged that audiobook in Libby for myself because you were raving about it. Um, it is quite long. Oh, oh, yeah. It's, it's, it's like a 32 hour audiobook. Yes. So, uh, yeah, but you can do it at one and a half speed and knock it to 21. Oh, sure. <laughs> sure, sure, sure. Um, no, I listen to all of my audiobooks now at at least 1.5. Oh, wow. Um, I did 1.25 because I liked, I wanted to hear the accent. Sure. I didn't want to miss no, the that. southern accents. And yeah. it wasn't like, you know how some of them are hokey? Mm-hmm. Yeah. No, yeah. I, I, I thought his was pretty well done. Yeah. Um, and then also just a plug, in Libby, you can search by narrator. So you can either type in the narrator's name or if you go into the little record for Demon Copperhead, you can click on the narrator's name and it'll show you all of the other audiobooks yeah. narrated by the same person. Yeah, and I'm so. going to I'm going to investigate you're gonna be doing some that? of those, yeah. <laughs> oh. Excellent. Nice. Yeah. All right. Well, let me see what I have that's going to go well. Well, all right. I'm just going to do the one that's next on my list. So, my next one is going to be Sea of Tranquility. Oh, okay. By Emily St. John Mandel. Um, this is not going to be a shock to anyone who has been listening for a while because you know that I fangirl all over Emily St. John Mandel. Um, so this is the third book of hers set in kind of the same universe as Station Eleven and okay. The Glass Hotel. Um, so the way she ties things together um, – It's not like a sequel or directly related plot wise, but there will be like a minor character in one book that shows up in the next book and kind of ties things together a little bit. So that happens here as well. Um, But this book uh, is about time travel a little bit. So it's another kind of genre adjacent book, though I would call this much more literary fiction than I would like science fiction. Um, But the Sea of Tranquility is a reference to the moon because in this world, in this book, um, in a couple hundred years, the earth has colonies on the moon. Um, And that's where our main character grows up um, and lives. And that kind of informs a lot of what's going on and he I don't want to give too much away of the plot um, because in some ways this book is a little bit of a mystery Hmm. Um, but it's also I have such a hard time talking about her writing because it's very meditative almost for me Um, so there is a mystery but it's not like a plotty book it's not propulsive in the way that a thriller would be um it's very lyrical writing um and there are like four different timelines that tie together 
um, and different sets of characters. And by the end of the book, they've all kind of collapsed together and come together and you kind of understand why. Um, but it is just, so if you liked Station Eleven or you liked The Glass Hotel, you are almost guaranteed to enjoy Sea of Tranquility. Um, if you didn't like either of those other books, give this one a miss because they are very much, um, they have the same feel to them. Now, I didn't read The Glass Hotel, but mm -hmm. I loved Station Eleven. Mm -hmm. Do I need to read the other one before I read this one? You don't. Okay. No. There are some references and some character overlaps, but it's not anything, like, you're not expected to remember. Okay like plot points from the other book for it to make sense. Sounds good. Yeah. All right. So my next one is called Tomorrow and Tomorrow and Tomorrow by Gabrielle Zevin. This was another book of the month club pick for me. It was very thought provoking and I think it's going to be like a future American classic. Just my humble opinion. Really? Yeah. Um, it involves three main characters. We have Sam Mazur. Sam is an avid gamer who is half Jewish, half Korean. He's partially disabled due to a horrible car accident, and he's very much a loner. Then we have, um, and tragedy has really permeated his life. His pain is a part of his daily life. He lives with his grandparents in K-Town, the Korean part mm -hmm. of um, Los Angeles, and they own a little restaurant, and they have a Donkey Kong machine, which he owns the, the record for sure. in his grandparents' pizza restaurant. So, yes, a Korean pizza restaurant. So I love it. I want to go. Yeah. So his first friend that he meets is a girl named Sadie Green. Sadie is a young girl. She's trapped in the hospital because of um, her older sister is a cancer patient. So she meets Sam you know, on one of her many visits to her sisters, and they bond over gaming, like sitting out in the lobby playing video games, and each of them feels like they have found a loyal and true friend. Only Sadie has another motive, too. Like, I don't know whether it's for her bat mitzvah, but she wants to... She She's earning volunteer hours mm -hmm. for her, her temple. Um, and when Sam finds out, he is just devastated oh so she's like considering her time with him yes, volunteer as Ooh. yeah so their friendship ends abruptly yeah. so fast forward they're both now in college um, sam is at harvard and sadie is a student at mit and one time on a train platform they're both in boston for people that don't know but um they connect oh someone mm -hmm. wave get You've the lights been on sitting for too yeah. long <laughs> so um <laughs> Sam spots him, uh, Sadie, and they reconnect, and Sadie asked him to try out a new video game that she has made for a design class at MIT. So at this point, the story takes off again with this friendship. He decides to let Sadie back into his life, um, and he asked her to design a game with him. So they create a game called Ichago, and it becomes a sensation, and it will change the trajectory of both of their lives. So Sam has a roommate named Marx, who is also a mixed race character with a Japanese father. And he later becomes their producer. Um, and then Sadie also, the gaming instructor that she had the game for is Daz Mizra, I think. He's a 28 year old game designer with a pension for young college co-eds in his class. So there's a lot of different things going on. Oh, yeah, duh, I, I did not like him at all. Um, but it was weird, like, with as much as gaming has to do with this book, mm -hmm. I personally am not a gamer, and I still really like the book. Mm -hmm. You know, I've, I've seen some reviews where people just, you know, gave it a pass for that, but... Um, for me, it was just so interesting because it was more about the relationships and the games and what people got out of them. And I like art and the references in this book. Like the game Ichago was inspired by the work. Have you ever seen that great wave picture? Mm -hmm. um, is it Hokusai? Um, 
But anyway, the wave at Kanawaga also found, it's on the dust jacket of the book, if you've seen the mm. book. Um, and then a speech by Macbeth, which is where the tomorrow and tomorrow and tomorrow oh, comes from. Okay. And a piece of fabric designed by William Morris called the Strawberry Thief. So you have these things that are referenced and how mm-hmm. they build them using this very traditional art forms that go into this game. Um, there are disturbing parts in the book as well. I don't want to give away any plot lines, but there are some unhealthy relationships, um, some violence, and then one of the main characters. You know, there is death in the book. So, But in the end, I love this book. I thought it was... Um, I didn't feel I was the target audience, and I still really enjoyed it immensely. So, yeah, I recommend it. I think believe did it win it might have won book of the year for book of the month club i think it did yeah so it's it's on a bunch of year-end lists right right now for sure yeah all right adding that one to my list too yeah so you said you don't think you're the target audience who would you say might be the target audience i was thinking what like my daughter okay somebody's probably 30 40 Okay. You know, 30 to 40 mm-hmm. that has gamed. Sure. You know. Okay. Would understand a little bit better. Got but, it. Um, okay. Yeah. Nice. Yeah. So. Yeah, that's been kind of on my radar, but it, I don't think it's actually on my list, but now it's going to have to be on my list. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Um, let's go with... Let's go with um, the thriller that made my end of the year list. Uh oh. Which is Blood Sugar by Sasha Rothschild. So I talked about this one in a previous episode. Um, this is the one where on the the dust jacket, it like the little text is she's accused of four murders. She only committed three. <laughs> um so <laughs> I I read a lot of thrillers. Um a lot of them when you read a lot of thrillers, they tend to feel samey mm-hmm. after a while yeah i think you've had this experience as well claire um but this one did not feel samey at all this was a very fresh take on thriller um so our main character is ruby you know from the beginning that she is a mur- before you even open the book you know she has killed three people um but the interesting thing about ruby is that she's not just a sociopath like she is a therapist in her day job. Like she's got a a lot of that emotional intelligence. Um, she is an animal lover. Like she volunteers at an animal sanctuary and fears, feels very strongly about animal welfare. Like she's got all of these positive qualities. Um, she just kills people. She's just not averse to a little light murdering here and there when warranted. Um, so the the part of the book um like the thing that keeps you going is who is this fourth victim and did she actually commit the murder okay like what actually happened um so there are a lot of um there are a lot of questions that keep you moving through the book that do mostly get wrapped up at the end um So it's very satisfying. Um, And there were parts of it that I was like, oh, I bet that's what happened, you know, that I was right about. But there were also things that I didn't figure out before the end. So always a bonus. Always. When you don't figure out the end of the thriller. Yeah. Like three pages. (laughs) So um, it was a really quick read because... It moved for. It's very plotty. It moves forward. Um, The characters were interesting, and it was just a really entertaining read. Sounds good. I'm gonna have to add that one to my list. Yeah, it was really good. Um, Zoya Stage did a blurb for the jacket on that one, so that's how I found it. I think. Cool. Yeah. All right. So my next one, which I also have talked about before, but I really ended up liking was Book Lovers by Emily Henry. I know. I know. 
I don't really normally read romance books. Well, typically I hate them. Let's uh-huh. just be honest. But this book was just so much fun to read. And I think that's what stuck with me. Mm-hmm. I liked the characters. I liked their backstories. I liked all their messy insecurities. <laughs> and it was just funny. I liked mm-hmm. the banter back and forth. Um, you know, the sarcasm and everything just had me laughing out loud. So uh, the rela- And there was also a relationship between the sisters. It's Nora and Libby who have to rely on each other because their mother died. Um, Nora is the book agent. She's super smart. She's a list maker. She's very, very, like, OCD about certain things. Um, Unlucky in love. Her sister Libby was a sweet strawberry blonde, married with two children. You know, just they're kind of opposites, but um, they end up taking that trip to North Carolina, to this town where a romance novelist has set her novels, and they have like a 12 point checklist that's just straight from Hallmark, Hallmark Movie Channel. Channel, you know, <laughs> like wear flannel shirts and have a date with two locals and go skinny dipping in a natural body of water. But um, <laughs> it ended well. Like it, it didn't, the one thing I will say, it didn't wrap up with a a bow quite like Hallmark movie style. Um, it was more realistic, I thought. But yeah, I devoured it pretty much in a day. And thank you, Emily Henry, for taking me out of my comfort zone and making me like a romance book. So that's awesome. Yeah. All right. It, yeah. Again, yes. added to the list. I know. I know. <laughs> nice. All right. So I have, I have two left. Um, let's go with. Let's go with this one. So um, I am now going to talk about the third book in a series, which, I mean, is not usually the way you want to go. But so here's the thing. A million years ago on Book Break, I talked about Gideon the Ninth, which is the strangest and awesomest science fiction book I have read in a long time. So um, Necromancers in Space is Gideon the Ninth. Right. So that was the first book in the series. Nona the Ninth by Tamsin Muir is the third book. Um, And it originally it's a bonus book. It's not the book that was originally supposed to come. This was originally supposed to be a trilogy. There's still one more book left. And I guess as she started writing the what was supposed to be the last book, she was like, no, I have this other story that I need to tell. So I was very upset because like the publication date kept pushing out and out and out for what was supposed to be the last book. But then we got a bonus book and it is so much fun. And so it's set in the same universe, some of the same characters. Um, but the thing that, about this series and why I feel like I can talk about the third book in the series, which I wouldn't normally do for this kind of thing is that each book in this series just plops you down in an entirely new situation and you have no idea what's going on so for each of the three books in this series I spent like at least the first hundred pages just trying to figure out what was happening and that doesn't seem like it would be a good thing but by the time you figure it out You're so hooked that you have to keep going um, and you feel so proud of yourself (laughs) for being smart enough to figure out what's going on. You're like, ah, yes, now I can read the end. So I got to the end (laughs) of the first book, which does the same thing. Like you're reading and I'm like, what am I even looking at on this page? And then you figure it out and you're like, ah, this book is awesome. I love it. Where's the next book? And you open the next book and you're like, wait. She's changed all of the rules. Like, what is happening? And then the same thing happens, like, 100 pages in. You're like, oh, I get it now. And it's, like, really, I want to meet this woman. I Like, <laughs> I want to understand how her brain works. Yeah. Um, so I don't even feel like I need to talk about the plot of this book, really, because in some ways it's not important. It's... Um, it's the ride of the book and of the series of just like reading something completely different and new from anything that you've read before um, and just immersing yourself in that universe. That sounds fun. It's really fun. 
I am not sure that it's a book for Claire. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> Just saying. Yeah, the necromancers um, and so well, Yeah, I mean, I so, know. yeah. Um, but the experience of it is a total blast. Yeah. Well, good. Yeah. All right. I, you know, I, I just noticed I don't have a thriller on my list. And I think it's because, like we were saying, mm-hmm. a lot of them are three or maybe fours for me. Yeah. But there's very few that blow me away anymore. Mm-hmm. But one that did blow me away was The Remarkably Bright Creatures yes. by Shelby Van Pelt. And really, it wasn't even the people. It's the octopus. It was Marcellus the octopus. <laughs> Marcellus just did it for me. It's like my most memorable character, probably next to Demon Copperhead, is Marcellus the octopus. There you so go. Um, it's quirky, it's fun. You know, 70 year old Tova is a housekeeper at Sowell Bay Aquarium. She takes a lot of pride in her work, financially stable, and she's trying to cope with her, the loss of her husband. And her son disappeared over 30 years Mm. ago. Maybe this does qualify, because there is the mystery of what happened to her son. I mean, if you need it to be a thriller, we can call it a thriller. Well, it's not a thriller, but it might be cozy mystery, kind of, like, tucked in there. Um, (laughs) But she's respectful. She talks to these sea creatures, and she's friends with Marcellus, who likes to get out of his tank and get, like, leftover Chinese food that people have left on their desks. And so she saves him from being tangled in the power cords one night so they have this bond you know but he is just so funny he's so smart and their story ends in a really touching way so if you don't read it for any other reason i'd read it for marcellus there was another character in the book that was kind of major cameron Mm -hmm. about 30 kind of meandering along gets laid off a lot you know or you know he's trying to find himself he gets dumped so he was very irritating to me at first but he does kind of redeem himself in the end okay and, and gets up because he of course ends up working at the aquarium too um, because he's looking for his rich father in the beginning but mm. you know he ends up finding a better life so okay. yeah but remarkably bike creatures sign shines because of tova And Marcellus. Okay. Particularly Marcellus. Nice. Yeah. So my last book um, is a book that I'm not sure that I enjoyed necessarily, but it really stuck with me. Mm -hmm. And I still find myself thinking about it. Um, And that is School for Good Mothers by Jessamyn Chan, which I know you started and didn't finish, which, you know, no judgment. Um, It... A lot of it is difficult mm-hmm. in a lot of ways. Um, so this is the book. And so we've talked around this book a lot, I think, this year. Um, but I don't think either of us ever. I I didn't talk about yeah. it because I didn't finish and it. And I don't think I did. Yeah. Um, but so this is the one. So Frida Lou um, is single mother to Harriet. Um, She is fairly recently divorced from her husband, um, and she has a very bad day, what she refers to throughout the book as her very bad day. Um, And as a result of this very bad day, uh, basically Child Protective Services get involved in her relationship with her daughter, um, Harriet, and Frida ends up being sent to this kind of pilot program that the state is running um, called the School for Good Mothers. Um, and essentially it's it's a program that is supposed to take unfit mothers and teach them how to be good, how to be good mothers. Um, there is a f- pretty strong, like, dystopian streak Mm -hmm. running through this book this school is just horrifying in a lot of ways um but it's like that subtle creeping horrifying it's not like they're lining these women up and beating them every day or anything like that it's just more the surveillance and yeah there's surveillance so there's very much some big brother stuff happening um it's got kind of that same like um like 
overwhelming, big brothery feeling, kind of like The Handmaid's Tale, mm-hmm. which gets referenced a lot, I think, in people talking about this book. Um, and it's it's really it it looks a lot at what we as a society expect from parents and how those expectations may be different for mothers and fathers, um, what makes a mother a good mother or a not good mother. Um, Like Frida at the beginning, her very bad day is pretty bad. Mm -hmm. Like she makes some choices that a lot of us probably would not make, but at the same time, their choice, like you can kind of understand why, like how she got to the point that she got. And you might still be like, yeah, but I don't think I would do it that way. But like, it seems real that somebody might, like that a person might make the choices that she made. And, you know, so there's a lot of this grappling in the book. And I think the author does it in a really smart way where, you're never being like knocked over the head with like, you know, this is the way, this is the the thing I'm trying to get across. Like it's, it's very subtle it, through a lot of the book. And sometimes just the way things are presented very matter of factly. Mm-hmm. Um, and everyone is just kind of like, oh, yes, yes, yes. And you're like, oh, yeah, wait, 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 wait. <laughs> So it's unsettling. I'm not sure that I liked Frida very much. Um, I'm not sure that I liked a lot of the characters very much. Um, But they all feel real and three-dimensional. And like I said at the beginning, it it really stuck with me. And I still find myself thinking about it. And I still want to like, talk about this book with other people because I'm still trying to work through all of it months later. Wow. It's kind of like me with Parable of the Sower. Yes. Yeah. Could not stop thinking about that Mm -hmm. book either. Absolutely. Yeah. So top five books, 2022. That was it for me. That was it for me. Um, so the one thing I didn't have on my list this year was a nonfiction because I didn't read any that was published in 2022, oh. which is like I always try to get at least one and I just didn't yeah, didn't work this year. No, it was it was hard. You know, like I said, if I had picked a mystery, I liked the third one of the oh that old folks home. I can't, oh, the, the Thursday Murder Club or whatever. Yeah, yeah, yeah. The third one of that. I actually mm-hmm. think that series is getting better as it goes along. Really? But, yeah. Okay. I um, haven't read any of those. Yeah, I like them. But nice. I like all things British, and it's very British, and it's misty, so. Nice. Yeah. Excellent. I want it to get picked up and put onto BritBox. Oh, I feel like it will. It must. It at must, some point. eventually. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> All right. So that's where we came down with our top five books each. We would love to hear from you all and know whether you've read any of these books and what is in your top five. Like, yeah. what were the best were books that you read fives? this year? Because yeah. I feel like there were a lot of really good books that came out in 2022. Yeah, because we're always looking to expand our to be Well, right. List. I mean, let's just add more books. Right. Like, I'm just going <laughs> to add a few of those that Kirsten <laughs> talked about Absolutely. today. Absolutely. <laughs> yeah. So you can email us. Um, We'll have the link on the last screen of the video, and it's on our episode page where you can also find links to all of the books that we talked about today. Um, And please do subscribe to our podcast wherever you're listening. Um, Like us and rate us if you feel inclined to do so, because that'll help more people find us and find more books. So this is our our only episode for December. Indeed. And... uh... We will see you again in the start of 2023. Yes. Happy holidays and get ready to start adding a whole bunch of new books to your TBR. Because we're going to talk about what's coming in the coming year. That's right. All right. Thank you, everyone. And until 2023, happy reading. Happy reading. Book Break is a production of the Grease Public Library, made possible through the support of the Friends of the Grease Public Library. 
Theme music composed and performed 